This is the 16th in a series of lectures on differential geometry. Now we're skipping over the lecture, uh, the uh, material on fiber bundles, and going into the material about cotangent and tangent vectors. So in this lecture, we'll think about the cotangent vectors and the cotangent spaces. Recall that the tangent space at a point of a manifold is a set of velocity vectors uh, at that point of velocities of moving particles flying through that point of that manifold on some manifold M. So um, uh, the, the cotangent vectors are uh, the dual vectors, that is to say a cotangent vector So these, are, of course, are the tangent vectors. Uh, and the cotangent vectors are the uh, dual vectors. They're uh, linear maps taking tangent vectors to real numbers, uh, so linear. And so, in other words, they're, uh, they're just elements of the uh, dual space to the tangent space. Um, so um, it it's, was historically uh, a bit confusing as to what the distinction was between a tangent and a cotangent vector, but luckily today we have a better grasp of linear algebra. We're more comfortable with making the distinction between uh, vectors and their dual vectors, the vector space and its dual space. And this is an important distinction for us because they really do transform according to different rules when we change coordinates. So if we... Um, take some coordinates, um, x1 dot 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 xn on our manifold m near this point m0, um, then we know that the tangent vectors uh, look like uh, a tangent vector vi is some vi d dxi. Um, it uh, represents a velocity and this is the, the, um, the amount of the velocity in this direction, uh, d dxi. So um, since these are, after all, the entries of the vector, we can linearly map uh, v to its ith component, which is defined in the terms of the particular choice of coordinates. Once we have these coordinates, we can expand out our tangent vectors as sums of, uh, remember it's Einstein's summation convention, so it's sums of vi's times ddxi's. And so... Um, so this linear map is well defined that associates teach v its vi, and that linear map has a name, and it's traditionally called dxi. Uh, the reason it's called dxi is that we think of it as me measuring uh, the, the the amount of xi motion of this of this vector. But since we think of a vector of a tangent vector as an infinitesimal uh, object, it's not supposed to be a kind of finite curve, but uh, but an infinitesimal motion of a point. Um, then its components are, after all, thought of as uh, infinitesimal increments of the, of the xi variables. So this is how much xi goes up by infinitesimally when you make an infinitesimal motion of point by an amount v. Um, so, it, so that's the, the motivation for this strange notation. But it's only a motivation. The precise definition is simply that dxi is the operation when, when applied to any vector that looks like this, spits out its component in the, in the, uh, the xi direction. So uh, since um, the, um, the vectors d, uh, dx1 dot 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 d dxn uh, form a basis of the tangent space at each point of our manifold where our coordinates are defined, uh, it follows then immediately that the dx1 to dxn form the dual basis of the, uh, oh, sorry, oh, this should be the tangent space, um, of uh, the uh, cotangent space. Um, so these vectors are called cotangent vectors. Uh, sometimes, just for short, they're also called covectors. Um, because we like to shorten the term tangent vector to vector. We often just talk about vectors on a manifold, meaning tangent vectors. And uh, these, of course, then are cotangent vectors. We call it called covectors in that situation. Um, the um, a simple example, uh, just the plane. Um, so that's our manifold um, with coordinates, say, x and y. So x and y axes, as usual, on the plane. Then um, 
we know that we have uh, vector fields d d x which looks like this motion in the x direction and then of course we have our vector field d d y which moves us up vertically um, and therefore there must be a dx which which gives you one on this vector field and zero on that one and a dy going the, uh, the other way around so some examples of such vectors are things like um, dx or uh, sorry cotangent vectors or covectors some examples of covectors dx is a covector 2dx minus 7dy is a covector and so on and so forth right so that's what they look like some uh, some constant in front of the dx and then some constant in front of the dy at each point that's what they'll look like when we fix a particular point of the plane and we work at that particular point say x naught y naught then we'll have any multiple of dx any multiple of dy but that's only at a given singular single point of course as we vary from point to point we could imagine the coefficients might be allowed to vary but if we have a single cotangent vector at a single point it's going to have some constants as its coefficients so um, to get a, a serious example of where we would come up with such a thing um, we could look at the um, at the example of a function and differentiate it um, so if we had a, a function f on a manifold some smooth function um, then we could uh, look at in coordinates um, it would have uh, say some coordinates x1 to xn then it becomes expressible as some function of x1 to xn and then it has um, uh, uh, associated linear map which associates to each vector v is some vi ddxi we can associate to that vector a number which is vf in other words vi df dxi and we said before that's why we thought about tangent vectors as uh, in this we use this notation for them we thought about them as differential operators on functions so this is an operation that associates to each vector the rate at which that function increases along the flow of that vector along the as that motion of the vector um, so uh, so that we could think of then as being well these vi's after all we know are by definition those are dxi's of v uh, df dxi's um, so this we can therefore um, say gives us a linear operator what linear operator is it it's a linear operator usually called df um, and it is by definition uh, its coefficients are these numbers here these are the, the numbers involved and these are the operations on vectors so it's d dxi uh, df dxi dxi this is a well-defined operation independent of any choice of coordinates um, after all, it can be defined abstractly without taking any coordinates. We can simply say that df is the operation on a vector given by having that vector operate on that function. And we define this independent of coordinates by taking any path with velocity v and asking how quickly f moves, uh, f varies along that path. The rate of change of f along any path with this velocity, and that's well defined independent of any choice of variables any choice of coordinates and so therefore this is as well and so df is actually this is the formula for it coordinates but it actually has a coordinate dependent meaning it's the operation which associates to any vector how rapidly f changes and along uh, as we move a path along a path with that vector is its velocity so if we wanted to work this out in an example well we've got an explicit expression for it just write down the uh, the derivatives of the function multiplied by these abstract operations dxi so uh, we're again going to be on the plane let's say and we look at some function f of x which is say x squared y plus y cubed then at each point at any particular x y point uh, df must be df dx dx plus df dy dy if you compute those out you get the dx is what is it's 2xy times little dx you have to include the little dx in there don't forget it. it it's part of the story right in this little dy here so df dy dy and the uh, derivative here in y is what's x squared plus 3y squared i think um, dy so that's uh, calculating it out and that means that at a particular point at um, just to make it much more concrete uh, at a particular point x y equals 4 minus 5 you plug in 
uh, the 4 minus 5 in here, you get df um, at that point. Let's say we can, just to give it some notation, let's say at uh, xy equals 4 minus 5 is, and if I plug these in, I get my, I think, if you plug in x and y in here, being 4 minus 5, I think you get minus 40 dx plus, I think this becomes out to be 91 dy. So that's important to, to think about. What does that mean? Well, the dx and the dy are not being made into numbers. They're still linear operations on tangent vectors. It's only the coefficients in front of them that get frozen and have actual numeric values at a given x and y, uh, a given x and y point. So once I specify which point I'm working at, x, y is 4 minus 5, I can plug in for those x's and y's here, but the dx's and the dy's I don't plug in for since dx and dy are linearly independent operations on tangent vectors at this point, uh, they don't simplify any further. This is as simple as that gets. Um, so practically speaking, the reason why we care so much about um, cotangent vectors is exactly this. It's because um, we often want to work with functions. We want to constrain our, our manifolds to look at submanifolds. Um, and we want the constraints to be expressed in terms of the vanishing of functions. Um, that means that uh, we will then get a kind of infinitesimal constraint on each tangent space given by the differentials of the functions. It's often difficult to write out a basis for a tangent space because in a high dimensional manifold it's going to have a lot of vectors. But if you only have a small number of constraints and a very large number of variables, you'll only have a small number of functions and so a small number of differentials of those functions, these dfs, which I should say is the, the differential uh, uh, differential uh, df. There's a small number of differentials of a small number of constraints and so you can usually write the differentials down explicitly, that ba a basis for them explicitly. Um, whereas you may have a very large number of variables and so a very large number of tangent vectors and so that may be unpleasant to work with. So the cotangent vectors or covectors are often easier to work with than the tangent vectors. Um, the, the, the result being that we're, we'll be working with various, a small number of constraints, a small number of cotangent vectors, we write them out explicitly and we wouldn't want to have to write out uh, explicitly some very complicated collection of tangent vectors. So when we have a small number of constraints, it's convenient to work with cotangent vectors and that's very often the case. Now, it might seem natural to, to wonder whether uh, there's any distinction. As I said, historically, it wasn't very clear that there was a distinction between tangent and cotangent vectors. People just dealt with them as sort of infinitesimal things, but they weren't very clear about why they were different. Today, we can be much more clear about this. Let's suppose we take uh, some smooth map of manifolds, and we take some, um, some coordinates. And so let's pick some point p naught and p, and a corresponding q naught, which is f of p naught. Uh, in Q, so a smooth map of manifolds, and we have this um, this uh, expression for uh, some points, and we'll take some some um, we're going to take some coordinates. First, first, let's just abstractly, without even taking any coordinates, let's define a map on cotangent vectors, and it's going to be defined simply by dual map on the vectors. We already have, let's say, we already have a map, which is our um, f prime at p naught which takes tangent vectors to tangent vectors. Um, so we know how to operate with tangent vectors abstractly. This doesn't require any coordinates. Uh, it takes the velocity of a curve on P to the corresponding velocity, the corresponding curve on Q, where I make curves correspond by mapping them through F. So that was how we, we operated. And we remember how that worked uh, in coordinates. Um, uh, so we have X1 to X uh, what do I want to do? Um, uh, let's say P on P and Y1 to YQ on Q. Um, we have uh, the Ys are functions of the Xs. And that again was a notation which wasn't quite fair because F is actually an abstract map, abstract manifolds. And this expression really is expressing the map in the coordinates, as we said before, really depends on the choice of coordinates. But still, it's a very, very convenient notation, and we can hardly avoid using it, that the y's are somehow expressible as functions of the x's when you make x's coordinates on p, y's coordinates on q, and you have a map that takes points of p to points of q. It must be somehow possible to write what each point on p becomes in terms of the coordinates on q, at least locally.
Um, so then we know that the map f prime uh, p naught um, as a linear map uh, it has a matrix. So I'll just write that it's equal to its matrix, which is the matrix of derivatives of the y's in terms of the x's, or if you like, it's the dy, i's, dx, j's, matrix of i's and j's. Um, so that was how we computed out this linear map. Um, now there's a corresponding map. When you have a linear map that takes one vector space to another, there's always a corresponding transpose map, um, which we'll use here. The transpose map goes back the opposite direction, though. This is strange and confusing. It goes back from cotangent vectors on Q2, cotangent vectors on P. Um, so you could think of this as infinitesimal constraints on Q. If you constrain the Y variables and you want Y to be f of X, that'll constrain the X variables. So this pulls back constraints on the, on, on the outputs to constraints on the inputs by uh, the obvious expression that f star um, on a cotangent vector um, should eat a vector by having the cotangent vector eat the image of the vector. You map your vector uh, to a vector of vector of inputs to a vector of outputs and eat it, and that gives you a way to eat a vector of inputs. So. Um, so that's how we can make this map. And then if we wanted to explicitly express what it looks like in coordinates, that would mean that um, the output, uh, uh, the output um, vector, um, covectors look like some uh, coefficients times dyi's. And then the pullback has to eat this vector by um, f star eta of some vector v i d v j d d x j's maybe it's better to use j's instead of i's um, so then uh, will be what well it will be this eta applied to this guy so it's uh, eta is this a i d y i that's this bit here applied to what's this bit here it's just um, d y i uh, d x j applied to this vector vj, um, and that becomes uh, dd, uh, uh, what do I want to say, ddx, uh, oh, let's see, okay, um, but that'll be ddyi's because we'll have moved into the y's when we, when we carry out the map. Um, this map here moves from uh, v uh, in x's to v in y's by multiplying this way. Okay, so that's the result, and so if we just calculate that out, we just get that it's ai dy i dx j vj. So that's how we can explicitly calculate in coordinates what this is. In other words, it says exactly if you can look at the role of the v's here, you can say exactly that f star of dy i is dy i dxj, dxj. So it's a very, very boring um, uh, computation. <laughs> it just says uh, to calculate out what the differentials of the y's are, uh, treat them as functions and just plug in, dif differentiate according to the rule for, for differentiating functions. So if you have a map, uh, cap, uh, the map f, um, you pull back uh, differentials by treating them as functions. If that was a function yi of, of x, I different, it takes differential, and we, we pull back the, the, the map by getting the differential of that function in the axis. So to maybe to make it even more concrete, we can just to compute a simple example of, um, of, of an actual map. Um, let's just do a, an actual map to make it very concrete. Let's make our map take the plane to the plane. B um, f of x, y is... Uh, u, v will be the uh, names of the output variables. These are the input variables, x, y. Outputs are u and v, and u is going to be x squared minus y squared, and v is going to be 2xy. So it's a nonlinear map, very, very simple. Let's calculate out what happens. Uh, f star of du. So we'll need to cal calculate f star of du and f star of dv, and then everything else is a linear combination of those, so that'll tell us what this map does to these uh, to these cotangent vectors, how it pulls back output cotangent vectors to input ones.
well, f star du must be, um, by our formula, du dx dx plus du dy dy. Um, so du dx, you can calculate out from this guy, is 2x dx du dy. From here, that's u, so that du dy is minus 2y dy. And so that tells us explicitly how the du output um, variable um, differential pulls back to differential in the to differentials in the in the um, inputs so it becomes a covector of the inputs and then similarly f star of dv is um, dv dx dx plus dv dy dy and we can calculate this out let's see this is v so we'll calculate out its x derivative is 2y dx plus its y derivative is uh, 2x dy. Okay, so that gives us the formulas for, in this explicit example, how to calculate out uh, how differentials, how a pullback. So again, in terms of this, we can calculate then how do all of the covectors on the uv plane pull back to covectors on the xy plane by this map. So if we want to make it even more concrete, um, we could say if we pick particular values, say x and y are 3 and 4, then the corresponding u and v are uh, u is what uh, 3 squared is 9 minus 4 squared is uh, 16 so what was that minus 7 i guess um and then um and then uh v is 2xy x times y is 12 2 is 24 something like that um hope i'm getting the arithmetic right and then um and then what we're going to do is we're going to say f star of uh, du is 2x dx minus 2y dy, and this will be at the point, uh, maybe I should have written it a bit more neatly, xy is 3, 4. Um, at that point, we're going to plug in uh, 2x dx 2y d minus 2y dy, 2x is uh, 6, dx minus 2y is minus 8. Uh, dy. Okay, so that's the the answer. Um, I hope if I've done all the arithmetic correctly. Um, so that shows you how how you actually can very explicitly calculate these things with real var actual variables for real maps. Now, why would we want to calculate these things? Because this really represents the the relationship of constraints in the outputs to constraints in the inputs. We have an x y plane, and we've mapped it to a u uh, v plane. And then if we impose some kind of constraint that we force the variables in the UV plane to lie on some kind of curve, um, we can differentiate that constraint, write it in terms of some function, and differentiate, pull back, and get the corresponding relationship between x's and y's. And we can also see how that relationship affects, at a point, how, how it affects the um, what its, its, its tangent uh, line is, how it affects the variables infinitesimally, so to speak, which vectors are, so we have some some relationship here between u and v's. We can plug in x's and y's into it and see what how it constrains the x's and y's. And then if you calculate the the infinitesimal relationship on y how the uv's are are constrained at a, in a single tangent space, you can calculate how the x's and y's are constrained in a single tangent space. The linear approximation to the constraint. Our next step is to think about how to put these all together. We've seen already that we can allow ourselves to vary the x's and y's in some smooth way, and we smoothly vary through a family of, of cotangent vectors. Um, so it makes sense to think about smoothly varying tangent and cotangent vectors. So let's think about that. Um, it won't be um, hugely important, but it is, it is an interesting observation, I think, worth paying attention to, that there are, in fact, ways to, in some sense, pull, pull the, all these things together. Um, so suppose we have m is a is a is a manifold. Um, um, then, um, well, if m were, for instance, just a smooth surface inside Euclidean space, um, then at each point we've had had this idea in mind that we pictured the tangent space as being some something like a plane just glancing off of the. Of, of the manifold. So here's our manifold. If this was a manifold inside Euclidean space, it would have tangent spaces that looked somehow like that. So we could think of it that it has not just one uh, tangent space, but it has all of these tangent spaces. 
and we want to sort of put them together into one big object. Um, so we'll uh, we want to sort of glue them together and consider that there's the possibility of having a point and at that point a tangent vector or this point having this tangent vector. We want to consider those all to be different vector spaces but we want to glue them together to one big manifold. Um, so for an, even for an abstract manifold I'll just define the tangent bundle of the manifold uh, to be the set of all pairs of point M and object V so that M is an element, a point in the manifold, and V is a vector in the tangent space at that point. So we made these tangent spaces, which were vector spaces. Now we're making one big tangent bundle, which consists of all choices of a point and a vector at that point. Um, now, uh, there's a bit of notational trouble here. Um, usually, uh, we think of, of a pair M and V as um, it's convenient sometimes to actually ha write it as a pair mv but we usually think of it as a vector v at a point at whatever at means um it's at a point m right that means in other words that it's in the tangent space at that point um so i want to think of it then that different vectors are thought of as being at different points in other words their little th their tails stick out of different points so that vector even if I take that vector and slide it over here and it becomes exactly the same vector but it's at a different point I want to say that's a different vector this vector and this vector are not the same even if they look in Euclidean space to be exactly the same vector just translated to different points they have different f feet or different sort of bases that they stick out of and so that's how I'm really keeping track of the point M where the where the vector lives but um, so we so we often uh, write M write V when we mean uh, when we really mean M V and so we'll often just talk about a tangent vector V in the tangent space what we really mean that's what we'll often write but of course what we really mean is that that's the pair M V uh, the reason why we want to say this is the real definition is that we really need to keep track of both and it's convenient to have a notation that gives us access to both of them at the same time but um, but at the same time, we, of course, it, it, it's often helpful to sometimes just forget about what the point is and think of it as a vector because we want to picture it as being a vector. So now that we have a definition of the tangent, um, the tangent bundle, I should say that's called TM is called the tangent bundle. It's bundled together; all the tangent spaces bundled together, hence the name. Um, and uh, we want to define a manifold structure. And the first step was to define the projection map, um, or foot map, which takes each um, tangent vector uh, to where it lives by saying that applied to a pair, it just remembers what point it lives at. It forgets the vector part. Um, and that's, so that's a useful operation to have in mind. Um, now I want to uh, now put somehow charts onto TM and I want to make it into a manifold. I want to make this into a smooth map. So to do that I have to start with a chart on M. Um, so we're going to start with a chart on M. Um, uh, take a chart uh, on M. So we take a chart say U of V on M, and I'll write that as U M uh, phi on M to remember my so it's an open set of M, and then um, what I can do is to take each element uh, M V um, in T M uh, with uh, M in this open set, and then I can say well then V must be an equivalence class. By definition, a tangent vector was an equivalence class of um, of a tangent vector representative. Tangent vector representative, which for us was a pair phi and w. So phi is our is our chart, and w is some vector in R n. That was our definition of a tangent vector. It was an equivalence class of representative, where equivalence was that we got to change the choice of chart, but we then changed the vector according to the, the, the derivative of the transition map.
So now I want to define an operation, which is some phi, let's say hat, some tangent thing, which is going to operate on a pair mv and give me out um, the uh, coordinate of m in the chart. Okay, that tells me where it goes in the chart. So that's the coordinates x of the of the point m in the chart phi, and then uh, the the vector w, because we know that every vector is represented as, a, as such an equivalence class of representatives, and that that w is uniquely determined. Um, it, because once you know what the phi is, you know uh, there's only one way to write the vector in that chart. There's only one corresponding object uh, for our equivalence class. So we can always write this unambiguously. Um, so that, that defines um, an object, which we want to claim as a, as a chart. So we'll uh, take uh, uh, these um, uh, phi hat as uh, maps for charts. Um, let's let uh, u uh, of tangent space be pi inverse of um. So that's, by definition, the set of all pairs mv such that m is in, uh, in our open set um, and uh, mv is a tangent vector in the tangent bundle. So that uh, then defines um, a chart. So we get some u tm phi hat. And so for each chart u m phi of m, a chart of m, we've constructed this guy as a chart of t m. So there's a bit of work to do though to make sure it's really a manifold. We've constructed some charts, we have to make sure that we compute out the um, the, the transition maps and that they're smooth. Um, so I'll let you check explicitly what they are and see that if the if the fees are smooth and these phi hats are smooth, you can write out explicitly what the transition maps are. It's not very exciting. And so um, also uh, you can prove that um, that uh, uh, TM uh, becomes in this way uh, Hausdorff uh, uh, locally uh, homeomorphic to Euclidean space. Um, R2n rather than Rn because it was Rn for the manifold M. Um, so it becomes Hausdorff locally homeomorphic. And I won't do all the details of checking all these things. I'll leave them as various exercises. And they're done in, I think, some detail in the lecture notes. Um, they're not very exciting. More or less, what we're saying is that uh, we trans uh, with the transition maps should actually be the maps we already wrote down for how to change vectors when we change coordinates. So we know how, to, how vectors transform when we change coordinates, and that should be the rule by which we transform their expression in coordinates, um, uh, thought of as coordinates on the, on the tangent bundle, uh, in other words, on vectors. Um, so it's not very deep, and um, so, uh, in fact, uh, so TM is, in fact, a manifold. Um, so I'll let you work out all the details of the, of the, 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 the transition maps and all that. It's not very exciting. And I think it's straightforward enough that it makes a decent exercise. And of course, the solutions are in the, in the notes. Um, so similarly, we want to define a, a cotangent bundle, um, which is going to be the collection of all the, of all the cotangent vectors put into one single object. Um, we do almost exactly the same thing. We take some uh, u, m, and phi. And then we take um, some, uh, we have some uh, pi, which takes a cotangent bundle to m. Oh, I should say, of course, cotangent bundle is then defined to be the set of m and let's say c, such that m is in m and c is a cotangent vector in m. So in other words, c is a linear map on tangent vectors at m. Um, and then what we want to do is to, um, so this map is, of course, taking C goes to M. So it's almost exactly the same story. And we want to say that it should be possible to work out uh, how, to, how to construct charts. Um, if we have uh, this chart here, we want to construct a chart. Let's say U T star M is defined to be pi inverse U M as before. And then on that guy, we have these M's and C's. And we want to write out what should be the corresponding, let's say, phi hat. Um, takes u t star m to, 
um, uh, to our well, some open set in R two n, um, and it should be uh, the the obvious expression. So if um, what we want to say is that if we had uh, we have this C, um, so we point at point M C, we want to map it to um, so phi hat of M C has to be well, it just has to be obviously the the underlying point has to be the point given by the chart. And then the question is how to construct some numbers out of this C that'll be its its entries in this chart. Um, if um, well, if phi star of uh, C i d x i equals uh, C uh, in uh, where x is supposed to be phi of m is our coordinates. And so that gives you a fairly explicit expression for what the what the transition map is, um, and again, it's just going to mean that if uh, it's exactly meaning that if we have some xi and if in coordinates xi becomes uh, xi dxi, then these xi are of course the uh, the uh, the entries that we use as coordinates on the on the possible uh, choice of the xi. In other words, it depends on a point x where it lives. So this is the x part. This is x, and uh, and then it depends on the choices of of the um, of the components that sit in front of the dx's, and that parameterizes the possible uh, cotangent vectors. So that gives us a, a manifold structure. I won't write it all out. It gives us a manifold structure that so makes T star m this collection of all cotangent vectors into a manifold, um, or to manifold m. And I'll leave you to to check what the coordinate uh, transition maps are. They are, of course. Uh, going to be that if you have some x, x i's and some c i's uh, for some chart, uh, then they should map by the uh, transition map to some y i's and I don't know, let's say, I don't know, c tilde i's um, by uh, the y's, our y's of x is the transition maps for the underlying chart under on our charts on m, and of course that it should be psi tilde i d y i has to be. Um, our transition uh, map, our change of variables map, is says uh, psi i tilde dyi dxj dxj, but that would tell us then that this has to be psi i dx psi j dxj. In other words, our transition map has to be that this quantity here has to be equal to this quantity here. Um, so it's just doing the doing change of variables the way you already know how. We've already done it in examples, and that's how we change variables from one expression of writing down cotangent vectors this way in x variables to writing down in y variables by the only thing it could possibly be. So again, I leave you lots of of of, of um, things to check to make sure that this actually makes our makes our cotangent bundle into a manifold. Uh, this change of variables formula, and so it uh, it does turn out to you know give us that the, the cotangent bundle is described by knowing where you are in the in the original manifold, your x coordinates, and then what are the uh, the coordinates that go in front of the dx's, so that our um, c is some ci dxi, um, and in our in the um, in, in the cotangent bundle, uh, these give us our variables ci. So th this lecture was particularly short because I've left a lot of checking of that things are manifolds to you, um, but it, it it introduces us to the notion of uh, of tangent and cotangent vectors, and it shows us also that the transition map law, or the change of variables law, which is perhaps the most important observation, is different. If uh, if I change from x i variables to y i variables, then I change vectors by uh, v i d d x i has to be vi dyj dxi ddyj in y variables. Those are the same vector represented in different variables. If I have a, a ci a d, and of course, the, how did I guess the right answer? How do I do it? Well, you stick in what you need. You need dy, so you stick some dy's up and down, and imagine that they sort of cancel them, say, cancel each other out to make these equal. Um, that's how I think of it. But of course, we can rigorously prove that this is the right formula for how to change variables uh, when we carry out a, a, a change of charts on on a manifold. If we have some ci dxi's, 
then almost the same reasoning should convince you that they're given by uh, changing variables according to, let's say, ci. That should be something like d. The only way you could fit things in, dxi, dyj, dyj. And that's the only thing you could do. Again, you're sticking in dx, dy's up and down. These are round d's and these are not round d's. But other than that, it's basically the same idea. And that shows you how you change variables. Note how different it is. For example, if the y's are just given by dilating the x's by 2, this is given by multiplying by 2. This is given by multiplying by half. So they do transform differently, even in the stupid simple case of taking the plane and multiplying every vector by 2. Um, just multiply all vectors by 2. Uh, the tangent vectors transform differently from the cotangent vectors. Why didn't we ever see them before? You may wonder, why have I spent so much time doing vector calculus? And, and it's always been vector calculus. There's never been any covector calculus. Why do they seem so different here, radically different? I mean, as I say, these ones double. When these ones double, these ones cut in half. So it doesn't seem right. It seems like I should have noticed this before. The reason is, in some sense, really just because so often we pretend that we already know the right variables to work in. So we don't change variables very often in several variable calculus, especially when we're working with vector calculus, with um, div, grad, and curl, and all that formalism. Uh, we don't change variables very often. And when we do change variables, we have to watch very carefully how we do it. Because, in fact, we so often in, in vector calculus make use of the inner product or dot product of vectors. Let's say, you know, v dot w is the sum of the vi, wi's. That inner product is only invariant under reflections and rotations and translations of Euclidean space. It's not invariant under things like doubling all the variables. And that's what we really use to identify. You know that if you have a vector space, you can identify it with its dual space once you pick a positive definite product. And that's the one we pick. Um, so when we did vector calculus in previous years, you were al always secretly using this thing all the time without thinking about it to identify vectors and covectors. But this thing doesn't stay the same when you double all the variables. And that's why we can't double all the variables and make sure that these match up. They don't get the same transformation law. Um, so on the other hand, if you do simply say rotate all the variables, you can check that these things are actually equal, these matrices. So in fact, vectors and covectors don't uh, differ at all. They work exactly the same way, transform the same way. Uh, they behave like the same kind of objects, as long as you agree to only, say, rotate the variables or translate the variables. But as soon as you start rescaling the variables, it doesn't work anymore. We really have to distinguish these objects from these objects. Um, traditionally, in, in physics, of course, we, well, we, we've already said these are velocities of particles. Um, and physically, we might think of these as momenta, although it's a bit hard to make sense out of uh, what are they are physically, because uh, classical physics only uh, works with this, always works with this inner product um, so in the background. So it doesn't distinguish vectors and covectors uh, quite, so, quite, quite so comfortably. Um, it, it's, uh, it makes them almost seem the same. Right? So, uh, but we could think of these as velocity, and these have to be a different kind of vector quantity, which you can think of as momenta. And that enables us to pair them against each other, much like we'd be able to pair velocity and momenta. So physically, I want to think of it that that um, that a velocity vector is a little particle travels through through space and it has a velocity at every moment in time. But how do I measure momentum? What I do is I take say a metal plate, and my my uh, my velo my vector bangs into it at a particular angle, not necessarily going straight into it, but maybe at some sort of angle. Um, so when it goes along and goes uh, and hits the plate, it then maybe bounces off and it moves the plate a little bit this way. So that means the little plate uh, feels a motion. The little plate is some psi, which has some particular, uh, this little plate has a particular direction perpendicular to it, a normal direction, which is this psi I think of as somehow the, the, the amount that this thing gets moved in, in its uh, normal direction when it gets banged into a part by a particle. Um, so, the part, so a particle has a velocity v. When it bangs into this guy, it pairs its velocity v against some covector psi, and that measures how much it moves the plate. And so the, the, the covector is measuring something about the vector, and that's why it's a covector. It's making a linear measurement on the vector, and that's why I want to think of it as representing uh, 
um, something in the dual space. This is in some vector space, which of course for us is going to be a tangent space. And this must be a vector in the dual space because it's measuring something about those vectors. It's eating them, spitting out a number, and that number uh, is then linear in the vector v, and so it must be in the dual space. Okay, so that gives us some intuition for why there are vectors, why there are covectors, why they're different objects. They're not um, the same kind of thing. Why it is that we've never seen them before. They didn't show up until we started allowing ourselves very general changes of variables, not just uh, simple rotations uh, in, in Euclidean space, but really nonlinear transformations or even simple things like doubling of variables. Already we start to feel that there's a distinct kind of two different kinds of vector quantity, ones that behave like velocities of particles and ones that behave like measurements of uh, linear measurements on velocities of particles. And we get, so we get different kinds of quantities and so we get different manifolds to represent those kinds of quantities, the tangent bundle and the cotangent bundle. So in our next lecture we are going to think about the problem that you can see already in this very simple picture that if we have um, uh, two circles, um, it's a very simple question about constraints and how constraints interact, constrain particles to lie on circles. Um, if you look at the those are two different constraints, you could say, well, the particles that live on both uh, are these, the points that live on both are these little points right here. So we constrain things by the red constraint, by the blue constraint, satisfying both gives us these two points. If you perturb a little bit, you move the blue guy just a touch, um, and uh, so we move it only slightly. And we move the red guy also only slightly. Um, then we can see that the intersection points uh, still are still there. There's still two of them, and they've moved only slightly. Um, but if you had, for example, started with constraints that were a bit more degenerate, so you started with two circles which were which were just tangent to one another, they'd only have one point of intersection. And if you move them slightly, they pull away from each other. They either pull away um, uh, or they, uh, they will uh, push together and um, get two points of intersection. So this is bad because the topology of the intersection is changed by slight perturbation. It's not stable. Whereas if they are crossing through each other where they intersect, then the topology of the intersection is stable. Why do we want um, to know about cotangent vectors? Well, because, of course, these are constraints. The red and the blue are constraints. And we're going to differentiate those constraints. And, of course, the derivatives will be expressed as covectors, cotangent vectors, rather than as tangent vectors. And that's why we really needed to think about this question in this lecture.